And uh, let's start looking at John Cage today. And um, I'm going to share my screen with you. And yeah, Cage Day. Uh, what a great day. Uh, just one composer featured today. And uh, I, wanna, I have a PowerPoint slide ready to go. So let's do that. Let me get situated. Um, you're going to be reading about uh, what's something called indeterminacy in music. And uh, it's another word for chance music. And uh, you're going to be reading the Casca Paino main text um, uh, 28, chapter 28. It's our last chapter, guys. Very exciting. And um, it's about indeterminacy chance music, uh, music of John Cage, um, and a lot of other things involving uh, electronic music. You'll read a bit about that. Um, they call it New Directions. Uh, for good reason. So I'm going to start looking at what indeterminacy is today. Really exciting topic. And I'm still letting people in, so bear with me. Okay. So let's see what this is. Indeterminacy in the music of John Cage. And um, there's John Cage there over on the left, uh, one of my favorite composers, because his ideas were very profound and striking and new and fascinating. And I just, I just love his concepts um, in some ways more than his uh, pitch, pitch material or rhythm. His concepts are just mind-blowing. So today, hopefully, we'll have a lot of um, minds blown by some of these really cool concepts. First of all, what is indeterminacy? So I'll give you the sort of textbook definition, and then we'll do an in-class composition, um, which is a fun way to demonstrate. Okay, um, indeterminacy is chance music, um, using dice to create a piece. All right, so like numbers on dice, you roll the dice, and you get a six, and you your pitch is F sharp six, right? Using set theory terminology. Uh, the numbers, right? Um, then you say, okay, my rhythm's going to be based on numbers too. So six would be um, a sixteenth note, and you create your piece using the dice or die. Okay, so that's basically what's happening. It's chance music. Composers reached a point where um, things were so ordered, ordered and organized. In uh, Belez, for example, we saw everything was set into a row form, very, very scrupulously detailed and organized. And composers after that said, you know what, it's, if I just improvise random notes, it sounds no different, so I'm going in that direction. And so a lot of people decided that they would rely on chance and um, create their music that way. So here's the definition, any piece where the compositional process involves chance methods to create the material. So like I said, using dice to create your piece or some other type of chance um, uh, document or materials or games. The I Ching is a, a Chinese document from uh, like 300 BC. We're going to look at that a little bit later. It involves um, some cool patterns uh, based on chance and numbers. Um, you can use this chance music indeterminacy for one section or you could do the entire entire piece based on your method and composers use indeterminacy in the performance of the work too so it's not just in the composition process like using dice to create your pitches or something but you could use it in the performance like the performer actually does it him or herself so pretty cool stuff we'll see this today um for example, like you could in your piece write, um, here's your collection of pitches, uh, C, D, E. Play them in any way you want, as long as you want, as short as you want, and move on. And you can put your pitches in like a box. And I've done it. Um, and say, play these for randomly, um, rapidly, for about 60 seconds. Or you could say, until the clarinet starts their melody when they feel like they want to come in or you know give like verbal instructions and there's this sort of like chance element to the music 
So it's sort of like um, part of your piece is describing what you do. So it's fixed, but then there's this other element which creates this tremendous freedom for the performers and also a great variety in performances from one performance to the next you get different um, results so really a cool way cool direction a new direction in composition uh, after 12 tone music so really exciting um, jazz jazz the whole genre of jazz um, and somewhat blues in that respect involves indeterminacy right you have um, lead sheets that you read off of a chord progression the head the main melody and uh, the performers musicians uh, play around with that material and improvise based on it so jazz music the great genre of jazz uses indeterminacy okay awesome so I want to look at uh, four pieces today by John Cage and um, woohoo Levi says you got it um, gotta love the music of silence yes you're right Daniel let's look at four pieces today that involve chance or some element of indeterminacy and there's a great variety today we're gonna have a lot of fun with this um, music of changes is uh, one of the first pieces by John Cage that uses indeterminacy or chance in his pre-composition and uh, right around the year of Belez's piece, The Structures 1A, 1951, around the same time. And like I said, composers were going in um, quite opposite directions. Um, but So their compositional process is quite different, but the end result, you could say, might sound similar. So you get, on the one hand, Belez, where he organizes things to down to creating row forms for dynamics, articulation, um, rhythm, and pitch. Um, completely organized on this side. And then you get um, uh, Cage creating pieces in a pre-compositional manner based on chance, random numbers that he found from this I Ching. Now, this is a, a document from, like I said, um, I don't know, 300 BC, or they don't know exactly, but around that time, a long time ago, thousands of years ago, this was created and um, altered throughout the years. And this is the I Ching, and it's um, it's a pretty deep document. And I have to admit, I don't know uh, all the ins and outs of it. It's pretty complex, and it's in Chinese, so I can't really read it. But you can see here that, <laughs> that um, there's patterns in these lines here. For example, this one up here, I don't know what Chinese character this is. Uh, perhaps it's a number or, or some kind of symbol based on, I don't know what, but um, you see this line here is solid. This line is solid, solid, and then you get a, a broken line here, solid, broken. Compare that with this one next to it. You get a broken one, solid, solid, broken, solid, broken. And then other ones have like broken, solid, and two brokens, and um, it. I think it's perhaps binary um, I don't really know um, but it is cool right Sabrina says wow exactly it's awesome stuff well Cage used this I Ching um, uh, to create his music in a pre-compositional manner um, so I believe from what I read um, this was given to him by his friend uh, Morton Feldman who is a composer that we'll look at a little bit later in the semester, like next week. Uh, they were friends, and he, this book, the I Ching, was pretty popular in Brooklyn uh, and New York City at the time, and so they were passing it around, using it, and referring to it um, to create compositions in a, a pre-compositional manner. So Cage took this and, in his own way, um, used his musical ideas. Um, certain chords he liked, patterns he liked, pitches, rhythms, and created a piece with it. And what you get is an end result that you might say sounds like Bolez's completely organized piece, The Structures 1A. So like I said, you've got these two different camps working simultaneously. One complete organization, 
in the precompositional method, and the other chance, complete chance, in his uh, in their precompositional method. So the end result is the same, and that's pretty interesting, wouldn't you say? So let's take a look at uh, music of changes, the the actual uh, details of the piece, and then we'll listen to it. Um, just some points here, and of course I'll put this on Canvas for you to refer to. Um, yeah, Cage organized the piece based on chance operations found in the I Ching. Now the details about how he did that, um, I don't know. I, I looked and I scoured the internet. Um, I couldn't find anything about like, you know, drafts of how he was working and his, his math, as I like to say. I couldn't find any of his math. Um, but if I do find it, I'll point your direction, point that in, you in the right direction to find it. I'll put it on canvas because it's pretty fascinating. But I, I, I imagine it's pretty complex. Um, we can just look at the end result and just know that it's chance music. It was created in a pre-compositional pre method that uses chance. Um, yeah, he associated pitches, harmonies, and rhythms with numbers from the I Ching. I think that's how he did it. I don't really know. Um, using his musical preferences and guidance from the I Ching, he fleshed out the piece. Okay, So I might have said, yeah, I like this chord right here. And um, I'm going to use that, but uh, I'm going to use like numbers from the I Ching to create a rhythm for it. And he saw the number, you know, one. And, okay, that's a whole note then, you know, something like that. Um, and... Um, here is an example of uh, Cage's handwritten calligraphy. Uh, let me get this. Okay, so uh, he's one of these composers that had beautiful handwriting. I know it's a little blurry to see this, but um, um, you can see his handwritten score here in the background. And this 104 is a measure number. Um, and this right here is this says forearm cluster so this is actually a lot easier than you think it's just the white keys forearm with the low a something like that and this little squiggly, squiggly line going down means you roll from the top down with your forearm literally on the white keys Whew, really easy and um, there you go there's my performance of uh, music of changes which, by the way, Music of Changes is uh, based on the Chinese title. Um, I think I Ching means changes. Okay. Uh, a fun little uh, anecdote here. The pianist who premiered the work, David Tudor, you're going to hear that name again, he noted that he had to, quote, learn new math to play the piece. <laughs> so apparently it's full of complicated um, annotations and um, performance notes and uh, new ways of playing, new, um, well you can see here that uh, it's sort of open meter. Um, in fact, this these lines here, as I've read, do not indicate measure numbers, but these lines in the middle, uh, they're not bar lines, but they're just kind of like midpoint breaks of the system so you can kind of stay on track with your playing and not get lost. But um, yeah, new math, uh, meaning like new symbols, new ways to play the piano, um, and of course, it's all based on Cage's um, uh, having fun with uh, the material through chance. And uh, let's listen to this. So I've got a YouTube video ready to go. What do you think it'll sound like? Uh, I, I, you can probably imagine um, pretty dissonant um, because it's by chance. Here it is. Oh, is my video? Did they take it down? Wow, that was quick. All right. <laughs> Let's uh, do a search and find it. Let's go on a search. Cage um, Music of Changes. And I want to find the score, so I'm going to do, and this is a good thing to learn. Just type score after you know this. And oftentimes you'll get the score. Uh, you know what? So there is no score at the moment. You can just kind of keep this in your mind. Um, it'll look like that. Let's just listen. Here you've got the Chinese background, the characters. Um, I haven't listened to this, so I have no idea what it sounds like. I imagine it's pretty good. 
Here we go. Oh, okay. So you got these like pitch clusters and rhythms that are <clears throat> uh, quite diverse, fragmented. Um, registral shifts all over the piano, um, dynamic contrast. Um, Sforzandi, uh, soft pitches, clusters, single notes, sustained single notes. Who does it remind you of? Boulez. Okay, I think it's fascinating. Again, you get these two camps doing completely opposite pre-compositional methods, but the end result's the same. What does that say? What does that say um, about music? Well, a lot of people uh, say in YouTube comments, you know I like to look at this for a laugh. Um, the first six notes sound like the Flintstones theme, Mike Simpson says, three years ago. Okay, all right, Mike. <laughs> Good observation. Um, Mario is earning a coin right after 326. <laughs> Funny. Um, it's hard to believe all this is written down. Luam says, yeah. Then, just like we saw in Boulez, uh, some people love it, some people hate it, some people call it meditative. Um, this got me through philosophy class. Um, I don't know. I don't expect that. Ten seconds in and I love it so badly, someone says. This music makes me happy. Um, somebody call it a, um, shit posting. Okay. All right. It's fine. Very interesting, I guess, but what a chore to listen to. Sounds like my two-year-old cousin. Okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah, interesting. Tell me your thoughts. Go ahead and type them in the chat box. Try to be um, objective, right? Objective. Say, oh, it's don't don't tell me that it sounds like horror film music or it's scary. Give me something intelligent, like oh, he uses texture this way, or um, it's effective piano writing because it uses a wide register, um, or maybe that's too dry to say that, but. All right, I'll leave that kind of up in the air. Uh, feel free to type in responses as I go forward with more Cage. Okay, so that's music of changes. Again, uh, using the I Ching and chance to create a composition. All right. Here's another piece that is quite different than music of changes. Um, first of all, um, Cage started doing or writing pieces that involved prepared piano, meaning um, you spend some time uh, putting things in the piano strings, screws, bolts, pieces of metal, rubber, various th household items in between the strings and the piano. And what that'll do is create um, a different timbre. Uh, you'll read in our chapter 28 in the Casca Pena Man that composers started experimenting with different timbres. Timbre, what does that word mean? Um, it's the quality of the instrumental um, sound that's coming out of an instrument based on the instrument's materials. A piano has a certain sound because it's made of strings that are struck by cotton hammers, um, wood hammers, right? Um, a horn, a French horn, has a certain timbre because it's made out of a conical bore, right? Um, a violin has a certain timbre, a quality of its sound because it's a string um, that's um, 
rubbed with horsehair and wax, and it creates friction, and that's the sound that's created. But it's different than a double bass because double bass has a larger body. So timbre has to do with the materials of the instrument and the size and the shape of it, the resonating body, if you will, of the instrument. And so if you start putting like screws and plastic and uh, nuts and bolts uh, and rubber in a piano, what kind of sound do you imagine that would create? Now, in the piano means like in between strings. Well, it's pretty unique. Um, I can use my piano right here and just, and I've done this in my music. What I'm doing here is just stopping the strings with my hand and creating different overtones of the harmonic um, series. different um, overtones of the harmonic series when you stop the strings with the hand put the pedal down on the piano very cool different timbre because I'm um, changing the sound apparatus of the instrument by using my hand so that would be called skin on strings um, let's take a look at this piece though um, prepared piano this piece is called sonatas and interludes and this what you see here is the um, performance notes of Sonatas and Interludes by John Cage. And um, let me just see what the chat box is saying. Uh, I'll get back to your comments in a second. You, you guys are uh, saying some great things. I love it. We're going to have a discussion today, uh, and you'll get a chance to talk about all this cool stuff. I just love it, right? I think you do too. Um, <clears throat> take a look at this. So um, we've got a screw uh, on B flat, or it's like in between B flat and another pitch. And um, uh, he's just giving you like dimensions. It's between uh, strings one and two, and it's ten. Um, I think these are centimeters, or no, this is distance from from the bridge, I think. And then um, just giving you materials to put in. It's it's exhausting pre um, pre performance preparations. This thing will take like hours to do. Just finding the right sizes of these screws and these bolts uh, takes a lot of time. I think all the screws there are the same size. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, enough to wedge in between the strings of the piano. Um, yeah, it's sonatas and interludes. The year is like 46, 48 after World War II and it's considered a piece for prepared piano so you're gonna hear that a lot prepared piano piano with various objects prepared in advance which alter the timbre of the instrument um, and yeah it's, these are the performance notes of the piece so let's take a look at uh, some more in-depth here's the full performance notes um, up here you get the tone the pitch material in this column and you know just going through each um, material and sizes and measurements that you'll use. Um, you can take a look at this on canvas, but that's this is the setup and this takes hours. I haven't played this piece, but um, I've done a lot of prepared piano myself in different ways. And yeah, it's cool. It's amazing. Um, and let's listen to it. Let's listen to it. I think you'll be surprised. Here it is. Let's go back to the beginning. Thank you. 
Okay, awesome stuff, right? Totally different timbre, throwing in these screws and these bolts and these pieces of rubber. Um, Daniel says, yeah, it sounds like video game music. Heavy, industrialized world. Awesome. Yeah, completely. You could completely see this in a game uh, in like this level where it's, yeah, industrial, like you say. Great point. Um, so that's uh, Sonatas and Interludes by Cage. And I want to look at this score for a second here. I think you'll be surprised at how simple it is. So this is just the excerpt of uh, Movement 5. There's several of them, but this is the fifth sonata. And so if I play this, make let's make sure that we're muted, that's all. Okay, everybody muted. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Okay, cool. Just so there's not like um, feedback or interruptions. Look at this score. I know it's hard to read, but um, this is all it is. Right? What is that? It's just a chromatic scale. I know you can't really read this, but this is a C right here. C sharp, D, E. Um, <laughs> it's entirely chromatic. So really easy to play. Um, believe it or not, but because of all those unusual things thrown in between the strings, you get these new timbres. Um, special sounds uh, from the prepared materials create timbre indeterminacy. So there's sort of like this element of chance um, on the timbre of the piece for the timbre. Again, timbre means the quality of the instrument's sound based on the materials of the instrument and so if you change the materials of the instrument or the resonating um, capabilities of that you get a different timbre a different sound different quality so yeah it sounds like this other world underworld in industrial underworld <laughs> so cool piece and prepared piano is something that was used by um, a lot of composers and it's something that was not just uh, a product of uh, this time period 1946-48 but uh, Henry Cowell in the early 20th century uh, started experimenting with um, extended techniques using your hand like I was showing you um, inside the piano or um, some other uh, prepared elements and uh, a composer that was a teacher of mine David Ward Steinman he took it to an even higher level and called it fortified piano, meaning it's like um, prepared plus, like even more prepared than what Cage did, fortified. And uh, if we have cha a chance, chance, chance music, if we have a chance, uh, we'll take a look at David Ward Steinman's music. Uh, great man. Okay, so um, music of changes. Um, using chants from the I Chang to, in a pre-compositional method. Uh, prepared piano uh, in sonatas and interludes to create timbre indeterminacy and uncertainness of the timbre. Just a little, each performance can be slightly different um, even though you have these scrupulously detailed performance notes. Um, but I'm going to take a look at a piece um, <clears throat> Well, you know what, I'll just play the uh, audio. Okay, let's let's just listen to a piece now by John Cage. Uh, tell me what you think of this. Okay, that was movement one. <clears throat> Here's movement two. 
It's a piece. It's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're deep into the throes of movement too. It's very expressive and slow. Can you hear it? <laughs> okay, right. So, um, what's happening? Um, <clears throat> so the piece is called, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll let it play as, as I'm talking because there's no notes that are typical or there's no pitches or rhythms or elements of music in the traditional fashion, right? Okay, this piece is called 4 minutes 33 seconds. Um, and it does go on a little bit longer than that, probably because of applause and walking on and off stage. But you do nothing. You just sit there at the piano. Uh, so there is no actual pitches. So what's going on here? Um, what is this about? Is this music? Um, and let's see what you think. Uh, literally, you just you walk on stage and you sit down and you do nothing. Is that music? What's going on here? <laughs> and so <laughs> reactions from people, it's the piece. Uh, oh my God, Isabel, Izzy says. Uh, Jesse laughs, yes. Uh, I'm dead. Yes, I, I'm not sure what that means. I'll pay good money for this. Jesse says, yeah, I know. I love how expressive it is, Karina says. If I put this on my recital, I can call myself a concert pianist. You could, Daniel. Absolutely. It counts. Um, is this music? What do you think is happening? What do you think is uh, Cage's message with a piece like this? What do you think is his message? What's going on? Why would you do this? What on earth is happening? What do you think? Go ahead and type it in the chat box. You tell a pianist to do nothing. Here's the score. I'm going to pause this so there's not like applause randomly and show you the score. Let's see what's going on here. What on earth could be happening? Yeah, here's the title, 4 minutes 33 seconds, um, composed in 1952 for David Tudor, the pianist, a uh, good friend of John Cage's. Here's the score. Movement one, tacit. Tacit means uh, silence, don't do anything, don't act. It's Latin. Movement two, tacit. Movement three, tacit. What the hell? Right? Um, what is this about? And so we've got some good responses here. Um, enjoy the sound of silence. Yes, it does. There's music in the silence, Jesse says. There is. The music of silence, Jack says. I don't understand this, Will says. Uh, yeah, I guess so, but let's try to explain it. Um, Karina says, so how do you time yourself doing this for exactly 4 minutes, 33 seconds? Um, some people use a stopwatch, um, like this guy. Uh, this pianist uses a stopwatch he saw, or his cell phone nowadays. Puts it on a timer. Um, there's another performance where the pianist like ostentatiously clicks or beeps the timer. Beep! and puts it down on the music rack and it makes a bunch of noise. I think that's a little tacky. Um, you have to realize that the original performance did not have a title. It, it, John Cage just said, go out and do nothing and enjoy the sound of silence in the audience and see what they think and just listen. And, uh, um, and it ended up being a four minute and 33 second performance. And so he said, okay, let's call it that. And that's how it got the title. Um, so it's you don't actually have to do it for four minutes and 33 seconds I think you could do it for a minute you could do it for four hours uh, the important thing is the the concept and so Jeffrey has a good point here I'd like to believe that it forces the audience to create their own piece in their head you write and um, in typical classes uh, I actually perform this piece I've done it for at least one class in theory four. Um, we don't have that luxury uh, over the internet, so a little bit, it's that a little bit of that is lost. Um, 
plus you can't hear the sort of music in the silence that you hear in a concert hall. So if you hear this in a concert hall, you would hear like maybe a plane passing overhead or shifting in seats or someone scratching their arm next to you or a cough here and there or a sneeze or people laugh or people say whispering, it's just, you know, whatever. So exactly, the music in the silence uh, is what he's trying to um, heighten or elevate or exploit. I like to use that word, exploit. The, the, the sound of AC is probably the most common. You're right, air conditioning, right? <laughs> the low B natural or B flat or in between those two pitches of an air conditioner. All right, so that's, that's the piece. Is it music? That's for you to decide. Uh, John Cage, again, he's trying to exploit the sounds or the music in everyday life to try to uh, point your attention to music that occurs in the natural day-to-day -day rhythms of our lives. So that's 4 minutes 33 seconds. Again, uh, genius concepts here. I just love it. Okay, the last uh, piece I want to look at today in our John Cage exploration um, is a piece called As Slow As Possible. And uh, this is perhaps the most mind-blowing piece. All right, so um, I'll just tell you the details. Um, this is a piece that has the total length of 639 years. 639 years in length. And I'll tell you why that is. Um, so um, this was a piece written by Cage um, of no particular length. He just gives you a score and leaves it up to you to establish the length of the whole piece. And so um, some uh, organists uh, got their hands in this piece and said, okay, well, how long could it possibly be? What's the longest possible performance that could happen with this piece? There's no definitive duration, short or long, length, in either, or short or, or long as you want to go. So um, there is performances for piano and other instruments, um, but piano doesn't really have like a, there's no way to sustain pitch after about two minutes or however long the pitch is, right? Because it dies away right away. So organ, however, does have sustain. And so some people in Germany decided that they would um, arrange it for organ. And so they were thinking, well, what's the first organ that was ever built? And so around the year 13, um, in the 13th century, the first organ was created. And um, they decided, okay, well, let's, uh, it's around the year 2000, so let's uh, subtract the numbers back from uh, 2000 to the uh, first organ that was built. And they ended up uh, going back 639 years. Um, that, that would be the, the year um, 1361, I believe. Okay, and that was the first year that an organ or one of the organs were built you know, around that time. It was also the year that the 12 note octave or the keyboard that we we know of, the white and black keys, was established and so the division of the octave into 12 equal parts was established in that year. And so they said, okay, well we'll we'll take that year, 1361, the first organ was built and the subdivision of the octave into 12 equal parts, that's significant. So let's Let's make a piece that lasts for 639 years to celebrate that uh, origin of music, the keyboard and the organ. And so what they did is they um, took this score that you see behind uh, my notes here, and they uh, took the values and approximated um, how long things would be, and it ended up being that many years. And if you use the, the values and the ratios in the piece, um, you actually start with a rest that lasts about a year and a half. 
it's insane. So the first note in the piece, the, f the piece starts with a rest that lasts for a year and a half, around that time, from September 5th, 2001, when the piece started, to uh, February 5th, 2003. It's a rest. You don't do anything for that long. Isn't that insane? I love it. Um, the first chord was uh, played in July 5th, 2005. And the most recent note change occurred in 2013. And the next change will not occur until, hey, it's coming up, September 5th, 2020. Where will you be? Are you going to go to Haberstadt, Germany? You can pay to see it change. It's a big event. And people crowd in this little church in Haberstadt and celebrate the changing of pitch. And I'll talk about how that's done in a second. Um, there's going to be a rest on March 5th, 2319. That's insane, right? There's going to be a rest. I don't know how long it is, but... <laughs> and the performance uh, is scheduled to end on September 5th, 20, 2640. 2640. That's just mind-blowing, okay? So this is the longest piece ever, uh, and it's in the Guinness Book of World Records, I believe. I saw some images online with that. Okay, I've got a comment here to check out. <laughs> I know. Jesse says, wow, I know. It's awesome. I, I think it's the coolest thing ever. Uh, so I'm going to show you the video, and then I'll, I'll tell you some details about this. Um, here's the, let's see. Here's a video on YouTube about, it's just one pitch. This is, I think, uh, the C and C sharp. I don't remember. Yeah. So you've got pitches C and C sharp. The C is the taller one. And it, this was from 2012, so this probably lasted a few years. And so you can see the sandbags holding down these uh, pitches on this organ that was made. And this is in Haberstadt, Deutschland. And they just hang out for a couple years, or three years, or five years. And here's a quote there. Uh, Perhaps we have to go back to my silent piece, 433. Implicit in this piece, which is called 433, and which has three movements and blah, 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 movements, can be of any length. Right? Like I said. You don't have to time your 4 minutes 33 second piece. It could be any length. It's the message that needs to get across. I think that we need in the field of music is a very long performance of that work. So here we go. It's another sort of variation on 433. That's right. And how they just hang out for a couple years, literally. These sandbags hang out. Five years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I might make a trek out to Haberstadt, Deutschland, and check it out. Here are the, the um, bellows. And of course, you've got your motorcycle helmet to just, you know, provide contrast. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody just put their, their helmet on there. All right, so awesome. Like I said, he's a composer of tremendously... Um, mind-blowing these these t these concepts are just like otherworldly genius thoughts so uh, a bit about the organ uh, for as slow as possible this piece um, the sandbags hold down the pitches um, um, and like I said uh, the weights holding down the organ pedals were shifted resulting in the sixth chord changes an organist just comes in and does his or her thing Two more organ pipes were added alongside the four already installed, and the tone became more complex in uh, 2008. The bellows provide a constant supply of air to keep the pipes playing. All right, so that's as slow as possible. The piece is 639 years in length. And uh, awesome. Here's the, the score. You can see it's kind of open uh, interpretation, th these lines here depicting just, you know, Depends on your set value. I think you pick the low A flat, the longest and lowest note, as your overall length, and then you base everything on that. You proportion, you create.
create ratios from that pitch and create the length of the overall piece. Here you can see uh, the years um, uh, according to the piece, the performance in Haberstadt. You've got um, May 9th, 2001 here. Um, it starts with the rest. There's no rest there, but yes, it is a rest. Um, and then 2003, you finally get your first chord. It sounds like this. With the elongated G sharp, and then you get like 2004, you get your next chord. Uh, 2006, finally you get like two years later this. And that sustains for two years. It's ridiculous, right? And then you get this 2008, you get... And then something happened with the C in 2008 later, and then 2009 you get a D. <laughs> and then look, remember that video I was telling you about the C and D flat? You have it, here it is. This is where the video was playing. The C and the D. Uh, they took it down an octave for whatever reason. And then all the different changes there. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that radical? I think it's awesome. So John Cage, uh, a highly conceptual genius uh, with music and creating these uh, chance pieces using chance, the I Chang, um, um, perhaps some dice here and there to create his pre-compositional material. Um, pieces that uh, involve chance, random things, um, uh, pieces that have prepared elements using timbre um, uh, in new ways, um, a piece that has no notes inviting you to just listen to the sounds in the natural world, um, and finally a, a piece with no overall length, no determined length, uh, which can uh, be played in you know a few seconds or in this case for this organ performance 639 years so great stuff i think it's awesome welcome to john cage and indeterminacy and some of these new ways of thinking conceptually about music all right so you'll read all about it in chapter 28 but i wanted to end today with our own piece uh based on chance and have a little fun with this and see what we can do ourselves. And uh, let me just get situated here. So I've got, um, you can see uh, dice. This is an online die. die. And uh, over here I've got a, uh, a, a score ready to go. And I've already associated uh, pitches with uh, the numbers on the die and then rhythm with the numbers on the die. Let's create a piece real quick. Okay, so four is our pitch, uh, pitch class E. So we're gonna do an E and then we're gonna do a quarter note. Here's my score, E quarter note. And register, I haven't, I haven't decided, but you could do that too. Here's another pitch. All right, we got a three. <laughs> so D sharp and dotted half note, okay? Dotted half note, D sharp. <laughs> there we go, isn't that fun? Here's another pitch, and it's same thing. Okay, another D sharp dotted half note. So let's do one more. Two, and what was two? D natural, right? And two is a half note. See, half note, D natural. You pop it in, and uh, make sure I put my natural. And uh, depending on how complex you go, and if you keep, go keep going, you're going to see some ties across the, the, the measure of the bar line and maybe some mixed meter in here. So here's my melody. Three, four, two, three, tie. Okay? There's, my, there's our chance piece today. <laughs> Brilliant stuff, right? So if you took this whole concept and developed it, and did it in your own way and found preferences and manipulated things as composers do, you'd create something like Music of Changes like Cage did. All right, so uh, that's all we have time for today. I wish we could do more, of course, but go ahead and read Chapter 28. Do the self-test 28.1. Do it all. Uh, send pictures to my email of that work, and uh, we will continue uh, with new directions uh, next week. Okay, have a good weekend, and uh, stay healthy, guys. Take care. Thanks for your time today. Bye-bye.